The Secrets of Star Wars is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. I am Emily Swallow, also known as the Armorer on The Mandalorian. And I'm just giving a little shout out to the Secrets of Star Wars podcast because this is the way. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, episode 103. Hello there. It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sentence was wrong. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're my only hope. This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I find your lack of faith disturbing. It's against my programming to impersonate a dead. That's not how the Force works. Force is with me, and I am with the Force, and I fear nothing. Remember... The Force will be with you, always. Hey everyone, I'm Father Andrew Kinstetter, a.k.a. Father Fett, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Wars, where we talk about everything connected to that galaxy far, far away, including the deeper themes and meanings. Um, Just a quick plug to share the podcast on your favorite uh, social media platform of choice. Um, It definitely gets the show seen by more people, especially those who you think uh, would be interested in hearing us talk about Star Wars. Also, if you would leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, that also uh, gets us seen by more people because the algorithms see that it's being reviewed and uh, gets us gets us out there a little bit more. So please uh, share the podcast and review us and let us know how we're doing. And we would greatly, greatly appreciate that. And and of course, we always want to hear from you. So uh, please, please do that. Today we are discussing the ninth and final episode of the Star Wars Visions Anthology series titled um, Akakiri. And so joining me tonight on the panel is the wandering Ronin himself, Thomas Sanherjo. It's great to be here. And second up is the Bendu, Angela Silana. Yes, happy to be in the middle once again. (laughs) Absolutely. It is great to have both of you on board tonight. And so um, we're just going to kind of jump right into this one. And um, as always, uh, I wanted to open it up to you guys to hear what your first impressions were of this particular episode of Star Wars Visions. At first, I did not know how to feel about it, especially with (laughs) it being the final of the Visions uh, series. Um, And I, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I didn't like it at first as much as I'm liking it more the more that I revisit it and learn more about it and kind of dig deeper into it. So I'm looking forward to liking it much more at the end of our podcast here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, 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 this is the most Star Wars week uh, Visions episode. And I think that's the thing that makes it difficult to, to really just full wholeheartedly embrace this one. And being the last one after we've seen so many others that have been so very both star wars and anime right uh it's it's hard to take this one in and go oh man they really missed uh you know and not not say that they missed a note somewhere but when you step back from that it is really really good anime that happens to be set in the star wars universe and that i think is what makes this one of my more well-liked ones i really i really enjoyed this one right at the end i enjoyed it and i think it was because about halfway through i realized we're not watching star wars we're watching uh anime kabuki theater Mm -hmm. set in the star Mm -hmm. wars universe and that that fixed it for me (laughs) okay that's that's an interesting way to look at it because i think um i've definitely been looking at all of these as star wars that just happens to be anime versus the other way around Right. Um, I would definitely echo Angela and like I watched this episode and my immediately thought my immediate thought was, what did I just watch and what is going (laughs) on? And and as I've sat with it more, it's it's grown on me a little bit because I have kind of gone back and and um, read about it. If I'd kind of gotten a synopsis before I watched it, I might have been able to follow it a little bit better because some of the the story was a little bit uh, jarring for me. Um, you know, but I, I feel like this one is, um, one of those things where I think it'll like Angela, I think it'll kind of grow on me the more that I, the more that I sit with it. Um, and, but I, I did want to point out, I guess a few reasons why I felt it was so jarring, but I, I, I think 
it was it was jarring because it wasn't what I was expecting, and so it felt discordant. But I think it was intentional that way. So like I mm-hmm. I, I I'm I don't want to I don't want to say that you know it was a it was a bad thing, but it was it was just so different from what I was expecting. And part of it um, was the music. Mm-hmm. And and I had um, read some other reviews on it, and it kind of contextualized it for me that this um, the the composer um, was Uzan. I hope I'm saying his name right. Um, and he he's a tabla player, so he plays with hand drums, and that mm-hmm. is the entirety of the soundtrack of this episode. Mm-hmm. There's it's it's so different than John Williams. There's no orchestral sounds at all. And so like some of the, some of the music just like, I don't know, it didn't, didn't fit what I think would should be there when, you know, the ship is crashing right at the beginning, you hear these drums beating and, and, um, you know, and it, so, so like it, that felt a little, uh, jarring for me. Um, I think the other, the other big thing that, that I, um, I have to just sit with is the fact that it ended on such a downer. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But there's hope there as yeah. well and yeah. that's i think it's it's challenging to like look through the the down the, the drop and that's I, I yeah this is it's a hard episode to talk about because really i think you have to watch it multiple times mm-hmm. and yeah. it's and if you've watched everything else and you've gotten the really cool star wars anime feel you kind of don't want to watch this one multiple times because you get through with it and you're like huh okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> But if you do sit and watch it multiple times, you get so much out of it. Each yeah. time more yeah. is explored and it's got more tail to it. And then you've, you've watched that. in. Uh, yeah. So we'll talk about it. And I think yeah. that'll help kind of put it in context. Yeah. But, you know, just to kind of uh, connect the dots a little bit with what you both were saying, because <laughs> I'm in the middle. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the The whole Kabuki theater thing, like. If you think about the drums, that is such a part of the Kabuki musical setting. Um, it's not the entire setting because they also use a string instrument, and, um, some kind of woodwind instrument as well um, with vocalization. But if you get to the very heart of the matter, it, a lot of it is that kind of ritualistic, tribalistic kind of underlying feel because I believe the kabuki theater came from the buddhist tradition and so there is this um kind of again that ritualistic feeling with the percussion um and it's a beautiful drum actually the tabla because it has these like con con how do you say that concentric circles yep, there you go. <laughs> um, that that create these different sounds and so with this one instrument you get all these cool sounds out of it um and so, yeah, it was definitely, I think it was a little bit jarring because in Star Wars, you're used to the orchestral score. And I was thinking about that and I was like, okay, Star Wars is really, we say that it's like space opera, right? Mm-hmm. But if you think about what is Japanese opera, it's the Kabuki theater. And mm-hmm. so I think it does fit in this particular Japanese cultural context. And and to to kind of extend that further too, the, the the music does exactly what it's supposed to do here, which is really interesting because the difference of a space opera is, and, and an opera in general really, is that it takes a small story and makes it huge. Like it just blows it up really mm-hmm. kind of out of proportion, really large. Whereas a lot of times what the the Kabuki theater was trying to do was bring that large story, that scary hugeness of the empire and the shogunate and all the samurai and all the fighting down to one story and let's focus on this particular tale yes there's all of these scary things out there there's this whole mythology to deal with but what's happening to these people and that the music does that where it it draws you in and draws you closer rather than kind of blowing the story out into this wider world Mm -hmm. um talking uh big picture again quick one of the other reasons i think that i found it um uh, subversive but in a way that i i wasn't expecting and i and and it unsettled me was the fact that uh this this has this story has clear parallels to the anakin padme uh, you know anakin fall to the dark side and mm-hmm. it was pointed out that 
with Anakin falling to the dark side, when you watch Revenge of the Sith, most of us, not all, but the vast majority of us have already seen the original trilogy. We already knew that Anakin was going to fall. And so like watching Revenge of the Sith, we never considered even that he was going to back out and be the hero and, and, you know, ultimately turn around. But this episode, we didn't have that same context when looking at um, when looking at Tsubaki. And so they mm -hmm. there, there's a lot of talk about fate and destiny in this episode, uh, which is really good. But they but they do some subversive things. So like in the middle of the episode, um, Senshu goes missing on the mountain and they, you know, they claim that that fate he's destined to die and Tsubaki challenges that and brings him back safely. And so they're, they're, they're like setting up like fate can be challenged. And then when he's set up with his ultimate fate of you are destined to become my apprentice, the expectation is that he's going to return and, and fight it. And the fact mm -hmm. that he didn't, uh, it subverted my expectations, which is like exactly what it should have done. But, mm -hmm. but it was still like, it was unsettling. And, and, and I think that's a good thing. I, I'm still trying to process that, but. Yeah. And you're also watching this character fall after like just a few minutes versus yeah. <laughs> in, you know, the Star Wars that we know, Anakin falls over like the course of several hours of storytelling. So we get to see the actual like slow descent, you know, yep. versus like, oh my gosh, <laughs> he's, yep. now he's just going to be a Sith like that. So <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that too, there wasn't quite as much time to just process um a couple other uh kind of uh things before we get into the recap is um akakiri in japanese means red haze mm -hmm. and um so that that is a really interesting name for the for the episode and it's it ends up playing a, a visualization of of the fall to the dark side mm -hmm. and and so there's a really cool point right there at the end where the whole tint of the of the coloring of the 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 whole scene is red and so there's a there's a visualization happening there um because otherwise akikiri is sort of it's not even mentioned in the episode but it's it's very much present um also uh some of the, the at least the the english um actors um i i knew or i knew i knew a couple yeah. of them um henry golding is tsubaki um he wasn't one that i personally kind of new from anything else um i don't know if Dude, you guys if you... crazy rich asians, crazy rich asians. God, that yeah. movie is <laughs> like probably the best modern fairy tale i have ever seen so if you yeah. haven't watched it and you're of age go watch it so so my wife made me watch that one after we watched shang chi and she was able to explain half the like slang that they're throwing around in shang chi she's like oh yeah that that means this oh that means this because she read the books and then watched the movie and she's like you have to sit and watch this movie with me now <laughs> um jamie chung as misa and um i know her because she plays mulan in the once upon a time abc show mm -hmm. um george takai is senshu so Commander Su or Sulu on Star Trek, uh, that was a that was a fun name to see pop up. Um, I think he also well, I looked up his credits for Star Wars. He played uh, a general in Clone Wars. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, yeah. I, that's that's awesome. So he's he's one who's bridged <laughs> bridged the gap between Star Trek and Star Wars. Um, Keone Young is um, Kama uh, Kamahachi. And there's a connection there that he's also the voice of Commander Sato in Star Wars Rebels. So that, yeah. was, that was pretty cool. Um, and then Lorraine uh, Toussaint is Masago, and I, I don't really know uh, her from anything else. So. No, me neither. Um, Paul Naka, Nakayuchi, I want to say, played the master of Tsubaki. And he played Sifo Diaz in the Clone Wars. Mm, okay. Lots of cool uh, overlaps there. Um, the other, I guess, big kind of thing to, to mention, and um, Thomas, I'm going to probably uh, bat this off to you, but um, as, as long as also in paralleling Anakin and Padme, this, this episode is also um, a clear homage to uh, uh, Kurosawa's The Hidden Fortress. 
Yes, very much so. The uh, in, in so much so that I was, I was loving the fact that the the two uh, guide characters were also stand-ins for the droids so perfectly. Yeah. So yeah. Was, you know, C three PO and R two D two, kind of that same way. And um, that's anyone who hasn't seen the Hidden Fortress, uh, it is the one thing that George Lucas has said was his main inspiration for Star Wars. And it, going back and watching it, you can definitely see that. And I and I love that this really kind of tied a lot of that into it uh it's got the same sort of overall feel of this kind of dark times have fallen and there's heroes that maybe aren't the perfect heroes but they're the heroes we need uh in in this moment and so yeah this it's really good uh lots of throwbacks to that throughout the whole throughout the whole episode but really the ones that that made it were the guides because they fit the two characters <laughs> that end up being our sort of stand-ins in this world of samurai in the hidden fortress the same way where one's tall lanky and they're both yep. kind of goofy <laughs> so yeah and, one and, of the things i oh sorry nope. uh that i did um before this recording is that i went and i uh, watch george lucas talk about the hidden fortress again i mm. just found it on youtube and um, he talks about how, uh, you know, the princess trying to cross enemy lines um, and the princess, you know, that being a connection as well with Star Wars. Um, mm -hmm. I found out that the actress who played uh, the princess in The Hidden Fortress, um, that her name was Misa. And so um, that is the name of the princess in this episode. Yeah, and that that very clearly is is seen in in Star Wars too with Princess Leia, and yeah, R two D two and C three PO who are the the goofy, uh, tall tall and lanky and short and squat kind of duo happening. Um, so we'll kind of get more into to details, but we'll uh, go ahead and jump into the to the recap and and point out some of these things as as we go along. So this episode uh, starts with Tsubaki um, arriving on this planet, and he's he's in a B wing, and it's he's crashing on this planet. And when he lands, he is um, immediately attacked by locals. Um, the The movement of this episode was very quick, so it was it was definitely something I was trying to uh, make sure I was really paying attention to what was going on. Um, and so, I mean, immediately it's, it's, it's clear it's Star Wars. He crashes in a B-Wing and he pulls out his lightsaber and he's fighting these locals. Um, and then he's, he's immediately, um, having these, these visions, um, which are kind of putting him to the ground and making him unable to attack. Um, and then he's saved by these, these group of, uh, this, this group of three, um, who turns out to be Princess Misa with, uh, the two, the two local guides. And it's uh, it's heavily implied that he has a past with with Misa. Um, they're they're kind of at, at this point in a in a cave um, away from people, and um, we hear that uh, something happened to her father. Uh, we hear that that her father, the king, was killed by the king's sister, Masago, who is a Sith lord in the royal family, and so. Prince yeah, I mean, go ahead. To, to pause there, and this is, I think, I, I want to put some context on the Sith Lord in the the royal family thing. There were, there's a lot of like, w when you're talking about Kabuki theater, there's a lot of mythology that surrounds necromancers. That was kind of their the, the big thing that you would have a sorcerer that would seize power, and the sorcerer was basically just a stand-in for somebody who could raise an army out of nowhere, and. It wasn't necessarily that they were actually a sorcerer, but that's the way that they were portrayed because it's easiest to do that. So you show this person that has these armies of undead that they can raise up to serve them. And that's how they were able to beat the noble uh, samurai that were in place at the time that were, in, that were in power. And so that's kind of what's going on here is that the turn is to just go from, well, what's a generic sorcerer in the in this you know mythology language to what's in star wars the equivalent oh it's a sith right mm -hmm. yeah and we'll get this to this later but i mean her figure is imposing mm -hmm. which and and especially as you contrast that with tubaki who's kind of just this kind of thin thin guy um so yeah uh so uh misa is telling tsubaki that that she's 
basically been in exile and and she's uh gonna have to fight to to get back to get back to the palace and uh Tsubaki is gonna go with her because he knows that Masago isn't gonna be able to be defeated alone and uh so that's part of uh part of why Tsubaki is is back uh we get this kind of fun the the comic relief the guides uh they have this uh engagement with um with Misa they're asking about about Tsubaki and Tsubaki is even questioning why that why they're even there and we have a fun callback to uh to Yoda teaching Luke about um uh judging by appearances because Tsubaki is just assuming that these two guides are completely worthless and well at least in a fight they're they're worthless and uh so he uh so they make the comment that uh Jedi judge by appearance, appearances do they and um <laughs> kind of puts uh Tsubaki in his in his place just a little bit but it does point out that Tsubaki isn't exactly like <laughs> the kind of epitome of virtue when it comes to to the Jedi like he's he's a flawed human being just you know like like the vast majority of all of us <laughs> So, uh, but we do find out that the, the two guides are, are needed because, um, Kama, Kamahachi knows all the back roads in and out of the, the city and the palace and Senshu has all the connections. So they are, they are crucial to get back to the palace. And these two definitely, I mean, are, are carefree. Uh, they, they're, they're, they sing this song, um, and I and I I didn't write down the words, but they they were singing this song and claimed that it was a protection song against evil spirits, and just are yeah they're they're goofy and fun and um, Tsubaki Tsubaki doesn't exactly seem to care for them too much. He doesn't like that they can't be serious. That's the problem. They need yeah. to be serious. This is serious work. <laughs> it's like. Eh. Not yet, it's not. <laughs> well, and, 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 and maybe there's something to be said there because, you know, okay, there, there, this, this, uh, there is this kind of oppression, you know, um, the, the Sith Lord has taken over the palace and, and it is serious, but at the same time, you can't, you can't like not try to find joy in the moments either, mm -hmm. you know, and, and th that can be applied to, to all of our lives too. I mean, we're, we've kind of been living in a world that is just kind of oppressive, you know, especially with the pandemic and, and I mean, just with everything going on. And if all you do is focus on like what's going wrong next and forget to live the moments and, and encounter the joy in the moments, life is going to be very miserable for you. And that's mm -hmm. not how God wants us to live. He wants us to live with joy. Was it St. Teresa of Avila who said something like, from sour-faced saints, deliver us, O Lord? Something like that. <laughs> I, think, I believe so, yes. <laughs> I, that <laughs> sounds very appropriate for her. Um, so, so, yeah, so the, the, the goofy guys are, um, they, they're more than just comic relief. So... And so they keep traveling um, and they, they're, they're on these kind of ostrich like birds um, is what I kind of um, uh, saw them as as they're traveling around. And they arrive at this village and um, Tsubak or they, they realize that the village is surrounded. And so the, the guides say that they can't go anywhere and they can't get around them. And Tsubaki figures out that there's a way to cross across the mountains. And uh, Senshu and Kamahachi are scared to go on the mountains. They call it the place of the gods, and they're going to be cursed if they go across the mountains. And then Misa offers them ultimately 500 additional credits to go, and they gladly decide to just <laughs> <laughs> abandon all of their fears and go on this trip across the mountains. And again, I have no idea what the economics of Star Wars is. I don't yeah, 300 <laughs> credits? 500 credits, okay. Uh, yeah, so, but, but here we get some, some uh, interesting things happen because they do cross the mountain, um, but there is this kind of fierce rain on the mountain and, um, all of them except for Kamahachi make it across the mountain. And so we have one of the many, in, uh, references to, uh, predestination and fate and destiny happening because Misa wants to go back for Kamahachi and Senshu pleads with her not to says that it's um divine punishment he's destined to die and if if they go back you know misa misa's gonna die as well and tsubaki 
directly challenges that whole notion of fate and destiny, and he goes back uh, for Kamahachi. And so this is, uh, I, I kind of mentioned this already, but, but they're, they're really playing with this, this idea of, of like of fate, free will, you know, are we, um, predestined for, for certain outcomes? And, um, and so that's just an, an interesting, uh, concept to kind of play with. And I mean, there's, that's common in, in all of Star Wars storytelling too, is, is mm-hmm. fate and destiny and, and everything. And, um, so Tsubaki is, is clearly trying to say that fate doesn't have power over him and that, that it's not this kind of cosmic force that the, the two guys tend to think it is. And so Tsubaki is going to challenge that. And all the more ironic, um, I like to look up the names, the name meanings. And from what I found about Kamahachi, it means eight turtles and long life and good luck. So, um, Turtles, I guess, being a, a sign of a good fortune. So the fact that he gets lost or hurt or whatever and is kind of ironic that they say that the guy whose name means good luck and good fortune <laughs> is, is destined to die is like also ironic. But then he doesn't die. And so that's, I mean, it, it, that, that kind of fits too, is that, uh, you know, he, he does survive uh, because, uh, because Tsubaki goes back for him. Um, and, and, and again, like all of this is happening really fast. I, I expected there to be more downtime between the, the, the rescue attempt and when they reunite and, and it was really just maybe a minute in between the two, uh, because Misa and, um, the other and Senshu arrive, um, at the, at the city and find a place to, to kind of hold up temporarily. And, uh, we get, Kamahachi singing as the clue that he's he's been rescued and back and is reunited with with his friend. So, um and this this again, this was kind of interesting to, if you look at the the entire context of the episode because Tsubak, Tsubaki is directly challenging that idea that um you know that that Kamahachi was destined to die and then he will come face to face with the supposed destiny of him joining the dark side. And mm-hmm. he, he doesn't challenge that one in the same way. Mm-hmm. I, I feel like you get the sense that he's challenging fate in the uh, Kamahachi issue because he's worried about the vision that he keeps having, mm-hmm. that he knows it's about himself. And he does, he doesn't want that to happen. So it's kind of like that, that, you know Yoda and Luke thing where they're talking back and forth and Yoda's like ah it's, the, the future's really difficult to see it's always emotion you can't really tell uh you know what's going on and so he's he knows that something bad is coming and as he's getting closer the visions are getting more and more clear but he's still not sure what that means and so he's challenging that destiny but what ends up happening is that he falls right into it and that's you know that's where I think it, it, it breaks him. And so like you see this in him that he's struggling against it, he's struggling against it. And then at the moment of it happening, it, it breaks him. And that's why that ending, I, I really feel like that ending is, is deserved because of that, because of what you're saying right here, where he's like fighting against it and then he can't avoid it. And he really does fall into it. And, and instead of continuing to fight, he gives into the whole thing. Yeah. And, and to, I don't want to, I don't want to quite jump ahead, but I, I, I want to mention this, that, um, that because the, the idea of free will is, has also been, been brought up with this whole thing. Are you predestined to just do this thing? You know, and I, and I wanted to at least point out that, that his free will was never taken away that yes, he does kind mm-hmm. of just give up and, and fall into it and, and go with it. But he, he still had the free will that he could have said no to Masago and say, and let let Misa perish. But he was, yeah, he was broken. He was yeah. devastated. And, 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 and it was kind of, well, and, and Masago manipulated him in the same way mm-hmm. that Palpatine manipulated Anakin in, in the same mm-hmm. context of, of fulfilling. Cause Anakin was, do, was doing this too. He had the visions of, of Padme dying and he ends up being the one to cause that in the same way that, 
that Tsubaki is the one that inev- or in- inadvertently uh, causes Misa to, to perish. But he still had free will in that moment. He could have turned away from that, but he, he chose to, to, to follow her out of his um, despair. I hope I remember everything I want to say because I know we're not <laughs> we're not, <laughs> we're not supposed to be elaborating on this point right now, but I really want to say stuff. <laughs> Thanks um, a lot, guys. <laughs> yeah, hold on to that, Angela. Uh, we'll, we'll get there <laughs> fairly quickly, I, I think, um, because to to go back, we um, we find um, all of them back together in the city, and um, and. Tsubaki and Misa are uh, then uh, infiltrating the, the palace. And it's there that we get the first uh, flashback between Tsubak- Tsubaki and Misa, um, which was helpful. I The first time through, I was not thinking that there was this um, forbidden love kind of relationship between the two of them. Um, when you kind of read the summaries, that's kind of how they portray this. And you can sense you can sense some some kind of feelings and tenderness between the two of them, but it took a couple times for me to to kind of uh, pick that up. And um, so, but we it does clearly lay out that they they know each other and and they are they are close, and uh, they're they're both wanting to bring stability and peace to the world. You know, Misa wanted to to do it back then, and she's still trying to figure out how to do that. And Tsubaki has been thinking about it for um, all that time on what he can do and what he can't. Um, and then he is unable to elaborate on that point. Um, yeah. And, and just real quick on that, um, the fact that she also wants this is what kind of makes it all the more tragic at the end. You know, mm. when you talk about the tragedy, the classic tragedy, um, you know, this kind hearted, pure person, you know, everything's going wrong for them. And then they end up being, you know, killed by basically the whole institution that they were trying to save or whatever it is, you know, um, that was very, I I found that to be very, um, the classic trope of, of that person that's trying to do so much good. And then in fact, you know, it's, it's her family you know, that ends mm-hmm. up, um, the royal family that ends up being the, the reason for her, her death, but then also him as well, being the one that, who loved her, you know, that ends up being, giving her the stroke that caused her death. So. Mm-hmm. Well, and even too, that's one of the, the, um, lies that Masago tells Tsubaki is that together they can rule but also bring peace and order to the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So we've still kind of got her appealing to his, his desire to, to bring about order, Mm -hmm. even if it's in this very twisted um, and corrupt way. Um, And then, so before, like I said, before Tsubaki, Tsubaki can elaborate anything, Masago arrives. And again, like the, the presence of Masago is huge. Um, I, I think they did really well with with kind of how imposing she she looked, and uh, the Masago engages them, and Tsubak, Tsubaki tells her that that she must leave the planet and never return, and they have a brief brief lightsaber duel. Um, anything on the the battle that that needs to be said, Thomas? I, I thought it was great. It was it did exactly what it needed to do, which was to just show that they're in conflict and they're equally matched, which mm-hmm. is, you know, that's that was the good point that was made there is that there wasn't really a there wasn't a loss on either side. No, mm-hmm. Nobody backed away out of fear. It was this is not going to go anywhere. Something else needs to happen. And again, like some of these others, like the, the duel itself is super brief. And, and, and we've talked about that before, that that's, that's totally, um, you know, appropriate for, for this kind of storytelling. And uh, Masago, um, of course, keeps trying to talk to Tsubaki and uh, Misa. And again, we have references to, to fate and destiny. She claims that, that the king was always going to die because it was written. And, you know, there is nothing that has not been fated. And um, she's she's trying to imply that that Tsubaki has this faith that he can't escape, and that is to be 
become her apprentice and join join the dark side. Um, Tsubaki has another uh, more intense vision, and uh, which actually prevents him from even noticing that Misa is being drug away, and and that's kind of crucial for for what's coming up uh, very quickly. And Masago is is mocking Tsubaki and you know telling him that this is the the limitation of his of his Jedi power, and she's telling him it's his destiny to embrace the dark side. And then we have another flashback, and this is to Tsubaki and his Jedi Master. And one of the interesting things here too, um, is as I kind of mentioned, the color palettes of the of the sh- of the whole episode. This one was very gray and kind mm-hmm. of neutral. And the whole the whole episode is kind of going more and more red. You see that very clearly at the end. But at that point, it's it's neutral. And uh, Tsubak- Tsubaki's Master is telling him you know, that he probably shouldn't, uh, go, go back to, go back to her and the planet. Um, someone else should probably go because if he goes, he's going to be tempted. It's going to cloud his judgment and, uh, his master isn't going to be there to, to save him. And his master also brings up destiny. He mm-hmm. says, I will be unable to save you. It is destined. It is destiny. I believe I wrote that down correctly, but yeah, I was, I was very interested in the fact that the master also, so Subaki is getting this talk of destiny from both sides, right? From his Mm -hmm. master and from, um, Asago. Well, and, and he's been trying to, to, to break free of that. I mean, from, from both sides and, and, Mm -hmm. and yet he's continuing to go forward and, uh, again, he inv- he inadvertent- inadvertently causes uh, exactly the thing that he was trying to avoid, mm-hmm. and um, and so that's exactly what happens. So at this point, he is struggling with his his vision, and he's, I mean, he reacts in anger to the idea that he is destined to become a Sith and destined to do this, and he starts. Uh, cutting down all of the 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 grunts that that Masago throws at him, and he doesn't realize that the final grunt that is thrown at him is Misa with a mask on, and he cuts her down too, and is distraught. And this is very classically like the the sorcerer control mind controlling someone, and that's how the way she's moving and everything. That's what it's supposed to be showing is that. She's very clearly under the control of um, mm-hmm. you know, of the Sith and of and being pushed into this situation. And that yeah, that was that was very clear too because she, she Misa was literally her uh, Masago's hand was out as she pushed her towards mm-hmm. uh, towards Tsubaki. and uh, and and so yeah, so she she is cut down, and of course the only way to save her is um apparently they didn't watch uh rise of skywalker but um sorry (laughs) the only way to save her is for uh subaki to to join masago as her apprentice and together with their power um they are able to to heal her well that's what masago says yeah, I want yeah, to yep. challenge this whole concept because it's <laughs> not clear. Like I keep, I was watching reaction videos of people like talking about this moment, and they're like, "Oh, so the power is like flowing from Asago into Subaki, and then that's how uh, how Misa ends up getting saved." But I want to challenge that because it's not clear. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. it, I, I, my in my brain, I choose to believe that uh, my canon is that. Uh, Masago is just lying to him that she needs to be with him, right? It joined with him and ordered for this to happen. Where in reality it happened and it happened through some kind of force ability. But I thought it was particularly interesting that in the uh, visual like depiction of what happens, Masago takes Tsubaki's hand and puts his hand on her on Misa mm-hmm. and just barely like is barely touching Subaki. And so in my mind, I'm like, well, it seems like Subaki could have done this by himself if he right. really wanted to. Like mm-hmm. he could have saved 
her or healed her or however you want to put it. But he gave into that despair, that feeling of despair and just said, okay, like clearly I'm just, this is just my destiny and I'm just going to give in to whatever, you know, it is that this lady says, because obviously I don't have any power over the situation anymore. I think that's, that's the more tragic way to look at it. And I think it's the, I would agree with you that I think, I think Masago has been manipulating him. I mean, every moment that she can. So I, you know, she, she clearly, you know, maybe she knows the force healing ability and could do it regardless of, of whether Tsubaki, you know, helped her out or not, or Tsubaki, if he knew it could do it without Masago's help. Um, but she frames it in a way that is very manipulative and puts him in this inevitable conclusion that if he wants to save her, he has to join her. And yeah, in his despair, he's, he's not thinking clearly he's distraught and he feels that there's no way out. And this is what he has to do. And that is more tragic, I think, because it's just an all, a, it's all a manipulation rather than um, even having any, any actual truth in what Masago was, was saying. Yeah. This is one of the hazards of duality too. When you start to mm -hmm. give into the fact that I am not allowed to do this thing, but it must be possible. And so when the other side says, Oh sure, you can do that thing. Right. Um, you, you give into that temptation to, to go to the other side because there's this duality where mm -hmm. well this side won't let me. So yep. that side yep. must be able to. And, and, as a Christian, it's a danger to think of evil as an equivalent to good. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the danger right there is when, when you are being told that thing is not good for you to not think, well, maybe I could, if I was just, you know, if I just stopped listening to this voice and started doing this other thing. And that's a danger of duality where you're saying that there is an equivalent power out there that is telling me something else and I can follow what it's saying. Mm -hmm. This is something I totally wanted to bring up because um, I was listening to uh, a podcast that has to do with psychology and, and they were talking about the psychological concept of splitting, I believe it is, is that what's happening right now in contemporary culture is that do that sense of duality, like good and good guys and bad guys. You're on my side. You're not on my side. Um, all this kind of, you know, making life into some kind of a comic book where there's mm. the bad guys and the good guys and everything is one side and another side. And so that's a psychological phenomenon that humans tend to tend to fall into, where in reality, that's creating a victim situation, right? Because mm. it's exactly what this episode is is portraying is this concept of this person who feels like there are two sides it's either fate or not fate that this happens and if this does happen oh my gosh it's fate i'm just going to give in whereas mm -hmm. in reality if you look at you know the if he had you know okay he did hurt misa right if he saw that and then said like oh my gosh like how how can i help her like how can i heal her um and he had held on to his will and not given in to the feelings of anger, the feelings of frustration, um, then he would not have become a Sith. And maybe he could have found some way to help her. You know, maybe she wasn't dead. Maybe she really, she just appeared to be dead. Who knows? Uh, but the concept is very applicable to us today, right? That like, mm -hmm. There's so many situations we get in, you know, I just had a conversation with somebody this past week about anger and about feeling angry. And I was trying to walk them through this idea that they were feeling really angry about something. And they thought that I was saying, don't be angry. Mm -hmm. But I said, no, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is what I've learned through cognitive behavioral therapy that I've gone through that we it's good and natural to feel angry because it's just a natural response yeah. Yeah. but to exercise your will to say what kind of power is am i going to allow this to have over me right mm -hmm. like what am i going to have um power over and ultimately taking that sense of um of agency 
and saying, no, this isn't going to be in control of my life. This person that's making me angry isn't going to be in control of how I feel. I'm going to say, all right, I'm the person that has the will here in my own, you know, uh, life. And, and I, and I'm going to learn how to process this, right? My feelings, I'm going to try to do it in a healthy way. And I'm not going to allow this to, you know, uh, again, have power over me. So I think that's ultimately something that, um, we all can pull from this episode. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that you, you, you brought that out. Um, I, I kept thinking, um, only a Sith deals in absolutes, uh, for yeah. one, right. um, <laughs> but, but there's, but there's truth in that, right? Like, like, um, I've experienced that a lot too, Angela, like there, there's a lot of people, you know, especially if I'm, if I'm saying the confessional, um, a lot of people just think that anger is a sin and they confess that. And it, and I have to remind people that, you know, and, and, and a lot of them fall into a sense of despair, like, well, I'm always going to be angry and I'm always going to be, you know, falling into this over and over and over again. And they, they, they sense that there's no way out. And so it's helpful to point out to people, just like you were talking about that, that anger itself is not the issue. It's, it's how we respond to it, how we deal with it. Um, sure. It can lead us to do something that's wrong. Um, and sinful, but it can also lead us to doing something that is going to fix the situation or, or, you know, make things better. And so we want to learn how to, how to, yeah, have, have power over it rather than it having power over us. And it's not quite so, you know, black and white extreme. It's, it's, it's a lot more nuanced and, um, poor, poor, uh, Tsubaki, you know, has kind of fallen into that where he's just, he thinks that there's no way out. And that he's just destined for this and he has to accept it. And so that's what he does rather than recognizing that he actually still has the, the free will and the, the, the power to do something different. You know, mm -hmm. even after he heals, he and Masago heal her, he still has the power to, to turn away from that. Now, one of the things about the episode is we don't know what happens next. Mm -hmm. So that could happen. I mean, even Anakin at the very end of his life, you know, was able to turn back from that. Yeah, but I think it's true. There's there's just something about anger to where um, it or feelings of frustration or whatever it is that it can be so overwhelming if you allow it to have that power over you mm -hmm. to where you feel like it's just swirling around you and there's no way out. You know, I think that Red Haze concept, you know, is just very uh, relatable mm -hmm. in, in so many instances in life. But you just have to realize that, number one, like you can't do it alone, right? Like we've talked about this a lot because it's a Star Wars theme, like, you know, community, family, you know, having that, um, those people to remind you. But then also, you know, you think about the master of Tsubaki mm -hmm. saying like, hey, if you go like, you're going to be tempted and I can't save you past that point. It's like, it's very interesting because that reminds me of, of, you know, what happens with Luke and Yoda, right? When Luke is like, oh, I've got to go save my friends. And Yoda's like, well, if you go, then things mm -hmm. are going to happen and I can't stop it, you know? And it's, it's really interesting because I don't know if that's coming from like a Buddhist, um, maybe perspective or something. But as a Christian, I watch that and I'm like, you know, exactly what you're saying. Father's like, there's always that free will in there. And there, there's never like, well, if this happens and that's pretty much it, you know? Right. So, um, yeah, I, I agree that, um, we, we definitely should, should look at this, uh, situation from a perspective of hope, right? A perspective of there's always hope, like Thomas was saying at the very beginning of this conversation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's interesting too, it's a possibility is, for redemption. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, seeing red is is a common way to to say that someone's angry, and I mean, so that that fits with the whole red haze Akakira kind of uh, thing, and and anger being, you know, what prompted. Uh, Tsubaki to 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 do what he did and led him down that road of of despair. Um, so 
so yeah, and we so we we don't know what happens next, and I and I have to hold on to the hope that you know <laughs> there could be you know that that redemption because I mean part of it too is is he may have in the moment agreed internally that okay I'm destined for this and I have to just give into it, but the reality is is that every moment he has the free will to choose good or to choose evil, and he still has the ability going forward to to change that. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, and then even like the final scene is, um, the the scene is on Misa, you know, as, as they're all leaving the planet, you know, and so we don't know what's going to happen next with her either, you know, and, and, and how, you know, what, what role she's going to potentially play in in the story of Tsubaki and, um, the, I don't know, liberation of her planet or, or whatever. So there's, yeah, I kind of have to hold on to that because if, if you just kind of end the story with, he joined the Sith and he's doomed for eternity. Like <laughs> that's, that's not star Wars, you know, mm-hmm. um, mm-hmm. there's always that, that hope that, that endures. Um, any other final notes that either of you have on, on this particular episode? Um, maybe just a shout out to the director and young Choi, um, who's actually South Korean. <laughs> Um, and she's actually the president and CEO of Science Saru, a studio, which I didn't realize, but they also produced the TOB1 episode. Okay. So, um, yeah, but apparently she is an award-winning wow. and critically acclaimed producer. Uh, so It's quite yeah. a different style from TOB1. Mm-hmm. But both heavily stylized. I think that was, the, yeah. that was kind of where they, they, they said, pick a style, run with it. Like, just go full bore into it right (laughs) i will say that i that this style in this episode was my least favorite out of all of the styles that i've seen so um not that i need to say anything more but it was just my least favorite (laughs) um so it's it's not one that i particularly enjoy but a lot of times i'll find that the animes that are done in this style are really good story Mm -hmm. uh, driven animes and so they're not about the visuals they're more about the what's happening and they're they're really intense and uh, a lot of times you know I'll, uh, there there are some anime movies that are just absolutely beautiful pieces of art um they're ugly as i'll get out <laughs> but the story <laughs> and the music and everything that's built into them is fantastic and it's it's because the drawing was done specifically to take the eye off of the drawing and off of the art and place it back onto the story that was being told Mm -hmm. and that's that's definitely what what it what it did i think it accomplished that for sure so uh listeners that's it from us on this episode we definitely would like to hear what you thought of akakiri so please uh let us know uh your thoughts um and you can do so by leaving comments on our facebook page at facebook.com slash starquest media you can email us any feedback at star wars at sqpn.com or you can tweet at us and we are on twitter at sqpn And before we finally, finally wrap up, um, I want to do a little bit of listener feedback. So we did get an email from Lee, and I wanted to share it. And he says, uh, greetings all. I finally had the opportunity to listen to the 100th episode this week. Uh, Great job as always. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts, insights, and your faith with us. As someone who is old enough and lucky enough to have seen the original release of Star Wars in theaters in 1977, I can say without a doubt that this that this movie changed my childhood. Racing around my backyard, holding a diving snorkel by the U-Bend as my blaster, I was Han Solo and my bicycle was my Millennium Falcon. Star Wars toys and action figures became a Christmas staple in our household for the next several years. Ha ha. I even still have a few in a box somewhere in the basement, though they have been well played with over the years. Great memories. One thing I wanted to point out in re- in regards to Chewbacca's medal or lack thereof, I definitely agree with your assessment that there had to have been a flaw on the part of the scriptwriter. In the last chapter of the original novelization of the movie published in 1976, uh, the ghost writer, um, ghost written by Alan Dean Foster, but listing George Lucas as the author. Chewbacca does indeed get a medal, 
The novel describes how Leia, quote, placed something heavy and golden around Solo's neck, then Chewbacca's, having to strain to do so, and finally Luke's, unquote. I believe the novel is considered Legends material rather than canon, but at least in the Legends universe, Chewie was appropriately meddled. Incidentally, this, in the same novel, uh, while not directly stating it, I believe the implication is that not only did Han shoot first, he was the only one that got a shot off. Keep up the great work, and I look forward to the 200th episode, Lee D. Awesome. As it should be. Han should have been the one. He was <laughs> right. quick with the trigger. <laughs> yeah. Well, and... um. I guess just to clarify, I want to say that, I mean, the novelizations of the movies are considered canon because I remember there was a debate on like the rise of Skywalker or was it um, the force awakens because they added some things to the novel that were not in the movie, but at least with the newer movies, the novels are indeed canon. And now I guess I, I, I'm not sure exactly what that means for um, the novelization of a new hope, but I would assume since it's the novel from the movie we can also consider that canon and then just ignore the the, the scene with Han and Greedo. And <laughs> <laughs> now I'm wondering what a, what a star Wars imprimatur would look like. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can't be George Lucas's signature anymore. That, Oh, <laughs> uh, okay. Well that uh, does wrap up our feedback. Um, so again, listeners, if you want to send us any feedback, just email us um, at starwars.sqpn.com or check us out on Facebook and Twitter. And we would like to take a moment, as we always do, to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create the secrets of Star Wars, including this week, Travis F., Frederick H., Megan S., Neil P., and Rhonda M., their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue the secrets of Star Wars and all the shows at StarQuest. And you can visit them, you can join them, excuse me, by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Also, be sure to check out our official Secrets of Star Wars merchandise. You can get t-shirts, coffee mugs, stickers, magnets, and as I listened to Angela last week, you can also get phone cases. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And uh, these would be an awesome Christmas gift if you are so inclined. And they encapsulate our philosophy of finding hope in a galaxy far, far away. And you can check out all of our great merch by going to sqpn.com slash merch. Also, of course, make sure that you are subscribed to the show if you are not already, and you can find us on any podcast player in Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, um, your favorite podcast player, and you can find us on the SQPN YouTube channel. And you can find all of our previous episodes by going to sqpn.com slash Star Wars. And now since we have finished with uh, the Star Wars Vision Anthology series, we are going to take a little bit of a breather as we head into the Christmas season. So we will be back in two weeks um, as we pause to take a moment to prepare for the awesome Book of Boba Fett that is debuting later in December. And so to kind of prep for that, we are going to just take a deeper look into the current state of Star Wars, and we will be having a special guest on the podcast uh, in two weeks. We're inviting Dom Bettinelli, our wonderful CEO of StarQuest, to join us for that discussion. So you won't want to miss that, but that will come out Christmas week. So that'll be our Christmas present uh, to you guys. So until next time, Thomas Sanherjo, thank you for joining me and sharing the secrets of Star Wars. It was great to be here. And Angela Cialana, thanks for joining us this evening. Arigato gozaimasu. Last one, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and once again, I'm Father Andrew Kinstetter. Thank you for listening to the secrets of Star Wars on StarQuest. Hi everyone, this is Dom Bettinelli, CEO of StarQuest, with a special message as we approach the Christmas season. This past year, the StarQuest Network has continued to expand our mission of exploring the intersection of faith and pop culture through our many entertaining and informative programs. Now we need your generous financial support to reach new audiences with more of the life-changing and uplifting programming we've been creating for more than a decade. That's why it's very important that we hear from you this Advent and Christmas, the time when nonprofits receive most of their support for the year. If you are already a supporter of StarQuest, we thank you and ask you to prayerfully consider increasing your support at this time. If you're not yet a supporter, please become one now. Every gift counts. 
Could you give $15 or even just $10 per month? Whatever level of support you can offer, please show your support for SQPN this Christmas. And remember that your gifts may be tax deductible. Just go to sqpn.com slash give. That's sqpn.com slash give. May God bless you this Advent, and may you have a blessed Christmas season.